You know, with summer officially upon us, it is time for one of the great traditions that always happens around the great state of Texas. Uh, it is when people go out to their backyards and they fire up the backyard grill. You know, you got to get the steak and the chicken and the burgers. You got to call the family in, call the friends in, and just have a good and grand old time with everybody around celebrating and fellowshipping. Now, I've learned a little something about backyard grilling. Really, there are two different kinds of people in this world when it comes to backyard grilling. There are those who grill using charcoal, right? You go to the store, you get a big old bag of charcoal briquettes, and you pour it into the grill, and you pile it up just right, and you put the lighter fluid on it, and you light it up, and then you watch it very carefully and closely to make sure the fire is going just right. You don't want it flaming too big, but then again, you don't want it to fizzle out. And then, of course, there's all the patience that is involved with charcoal grilling, right? you got to wait 30, 45, maybe even an hour's worth of minutes just to make sure those coals are perfect and white hot before you throw on your chicken or your steak or your burgers. That's one kind of backyard griller, but then there is the other kind of backyard griller. You, you know the kind I'm talking about, right? The kind where they just... Flip a knob and voila, instantaneous flame, and they're ready to grill because they grill with gas. Now, I personally, I grill with charcoal because that's the right way to grill, the way that God would really want me to grill, I think. And I was thinking about charcoal. And I was thinking about how marvelous it really is. You know, you can't just grill using one charcoal. That's why charcoal comes in big bags. You got to pour out a bunch of the briquettes and you got to stack them all up and you got to get them real close to each other before you finally light them on fire. And I don't know if it's ever happened to you, it's happened to me before, where I get the charcoal all in a nice little pile and then one of the charcoals just rolls away and goes off all by its little lonesome. You know what usually happens to that charcoal? It goes out. Because charcoal briquettes need each other to keep each other going. They need each other to keep each other warm. You know, we're in this series right now. It's called It's Complicated, Navigating Life's Relationships. And we are taking a look at some of the most common relationships that people have in their lives. We've taken a look at the relationship that a mother has with her children. We've taken a look at the relationship that a husband has with his wife, a wife has with his husband. Last weekend, we talked about singles and how they navigate the relationships of their lives. This weekend, we're going to take a look at friends. And you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that people are kind of like charcoal briquettes. We need each other to keep each other going. We need each other to keep each other hot with a passion for life. Without each other, we'll just kind of flame out and fizzle out. I've discovered that in this world and in this life, everybody needs a friend. Friendships are monumentally important. You know, we actually talked to some fellow Concordians who are good friends. And we asked them a very simple question. Why are friendships so incredibly important? Why does everybody need a friend? And they had some great insight to offer. Take a look up here on the screens. I think friendship is important because, as especially moms, we need a support system. It makes life fun. Having good friends around you is so much better than being, you know, all alone or um, always serious. Because you're always nice to me, we can play princess every day and we can cheer everything and we can play and sing songs and we can, we can play Rapunzel and we can play everything we want. We have been friends for 11 years, 182 days, 3 hours and 7 seconds. 7 seconds. I mean, we're always here for each other. Even though we're busy all the time, we're still like brothers, you know? I think what makes a really good friend is a person who is forgiving and forgets and realizes that you no know, one is perfect. Because you like to play with each other, because we love and we forgive. Friendship is important because they always have your back. Like, they never stop believing in you. I can depend on John at all times to be honest with me and give me direction, especially when I'm wrong. Having a friend like that uh, would make, makes it hard for me to, to step out of boundaries too far. We, we, we like to play games together like hide and go seek. 
My best friend is Jayla. We like to laugh together. <laughs> well, for me, friendship is important because I don't have family that live here. Your friends are there for you when your family's not, and they become your family. You want a friend that makes you feel better about yourself and, and helps you be a better person. I can't imagine being alone with no one to talk to, uh, no one to share things with, to laugh with, to cry with. Someone like who can protect you so that if you are sad, they can bring you up. Tyler is the most consistent person I know. He doesn't change. He's always, he's always respectful, always does what he's supposed to do, and doesn't cut corners. Well, thanks, Jeff. Because he <laughs> bathed with me all the times. If, if something that I need help with, just to talk to, lean on, I know Robert's there because he's a true friend. Because she likes me and I like her. And a lot of friends share the same qualities like food. Pizza's, Pizza's good. good. A good friend uh, keeps a flashlight on the rattlesnake while you go get your car to run it over. We're both stay-at-home moms. Uh, we both, you know, do the laundry and make the kids' lunches for school and send our wives off to work every morning. And, uh, you know, then we can watch Oprah and eat mom buns. Mm. Ow. That's good stuff, isn't it? They did a great job. You know, I think that's just an indication why friendship is so important. You saw it right there. Everybody needs a friend. The great Greek philosopher Aristotle said this about friendship. He said, without friendship, no one would choose to live, even if they had all the other good things in life. Friendship, Aristotle says, is one of the things that makes life worth living. Everybody needs a friend. You know, what Aristotle knew, what the people on the screens knew, is also what the people in the Bible knew. They knew that everybody needs a friend. And so over and over and over again in the pages of Scripture, we see example after example of close and deep and personal friendships. In fact, as part of this series, every week we've been doing a little quiz, talking about some of the different relationships that we have. And so we've talked about mothers of the Bible. We've talked about single people of the Bible. And today I'm going to give you a little quiz on friends of the Bible. So take a look up here on the screens. I want to see if you know the answers to these questions. Question number one, uh, many people in the Bible were close to God, but this person is actually called a friend of God. Who is it? Is it Abraham, Paul, David, or Adam? Correct answer is A, Abraham. James chapter 2. He is called a friend of God. Next question, question number two. This man endured terrible suffering. He lost his children. He was covered with sores. Three of his friends visited him to offer their sympathy and advice. Who is he? David, Hezekiah, Asaph, or Job? The correct answer is Job. Now, Job didn't have the best friends in the world. They kind of did him more harm than good, but he had friends. <laughs> Maybe some of you know what that feels like, right? <laughs> Question number three. Both of these men were prophets. The younger one admired the older one so much that he told him he would not leave him. When it was time for the older one to leave the earth, the younger requested a double portion of his spirit. Who are these prophets? Eli and Samuel, Joel and Amos, Elon and Ehud, or Elijah and Elisha? The prophets are Elijah and Elisha, D. Last question. These two men were close friends. Even though the father of one friend was a sworn enemy of the other, who are these friends? David and Hushai, David and Jonathan, Judah and Joseph, or Potiphar and Joseph? Who are the friends? They are David and Jonathan. Answer B. You know, it's actually this pair that I want to talk to you about this morning. Because the friendship between David and Jonathan is one of the most stunning and beautiful and profound examples of friendship in all the scriptures. And we can learn a lot about friendship from these two men. And so our text for today, 1 Samuel 18, beginning at verse 1, 
after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. As our text opens, David and Jonathan have just become friends. And in order to understand what precipitates this friendship, we need to back up a chapter to 1 Samuel 17, because in 1 Samuel 17, David kills a giant named Goliath. Some of you may know the story. A giant, Goliath, is a warrior who is threatening Israel. And he is so threatening, he is so menacing, and he is so big and strong that none of the Israelite soldiers want to go out to fight him. They're all scared of him, except for one little-known shepherd boy named David. None of the soldiers of Israel will fight Goliath, so David pops up and he says, well, I'll fight Goliath. He takes his sling, he takes a couple of stones, and he slings one of the stones at Goliath, hits him square between the eyes, and Goliath falls back dead. And it's at that point in David's life that he goes from being a little-known shepherd boy to a warrior hero in Israel. He becomes famous. Everybody's talking about David. Everybody's celebrating David because David has just slain Israel's worst enemy, Goliath. And eventually, word gets to Jonathan about David. And when Jonathan learns about David, he thinks to himself, you know, this is a guy that I've got to get to know. And so Jonathan becomes a friend of David. And it's interesting how deep this friendship actually becomes. I love the way the old King James Version translates 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. It says, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. You guys ever heard of bearing your soul to someone? It's when you open up about the deepest parts of you. You share the most profound secrets concerning you. That's the kind of friendship that Jonathan and David had. They were connected at the soul. Story continues, 1 Samuel 18, verse 3, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan and David are so close that Jonathan decides that he wants to make a covenant with David. And in the Bible, a covenant is basically a commitment. It's where one person says to another person, I devote myself to you. I will be there for you because I care for you. I will not leave you. I am with you. That's what a covenant is in the Bible. And what's really interesting about covenants in the Bible is that often covenants were considered to be even stronger than death. And that's why the most famous covenant in the Bible is the covenant that Jesus makes with his disciples the night before he dies on a cross. He gathers his disciples in an upper room and he takes a cup and he says to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is making a commitment to his disciples. He's saying to them, I care for you. I love you. I'm going to be there for you. Not even death can keep me away from you. That's the kind of covenant, that's the kind of commitment that Jonathan and David have with each other. Jonathan and David have a deeply profound friendship. But in the midst of this deeply profound friendship rises a monumentally serious problem. 1 Samuel 18, verse 6. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, and the Philistine is Goliath, he was Israel's enemy, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul. And I need to pause there for just a second because you need to know a couple of things about King Saul. First thing you need to know about King Saul is that at this time he is the king of Israel, and so he is David's king. Uh, the second thing you need to know about King Saul is that King Saul is the father of Jonathan, David's best friend, which makes Jonathan not just any old young guy in Israel. It makes Jonathan the very prince of Israel. Keep that in mind. That'll become important. And so women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and with lutes. 
As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can David get but the kingdom? It seems as though David's military victory has impressed not only his best friend Jonathan, it's also impressed the ladies of the kingdom. And so the ladies of the kingdom come out to celebrate David, and they do so with a little song. They sing, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. And when you hear a song like that, it almost kind of sounds like a slap on the face to Saul, doesn't it? It sounds like the ladies are singing and saying, hey, Saul, you may be a good warrior. You may have slain thousands, but David is even better than you. He's slain tens of thousands, and that's the way that Saul takes it. He takes it as an insult. Verse 8 says, this refrain, this song, galled him. But here's the funny thing about this song. Even though Saul takes this song as an insult, it's really not meant to be an insult. You see, in the Old Testament, uh, coupling the number 1,000 with the number 10,000 is actually a standard rhetorical device. It happens all the time in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, verse 30, how could one man chase a 1,000 or put, put 10,000 to flight? Psalm 91, verse 7, a 1,000 may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. Micah 6, verse 7, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? This is something that happens in songs and poetry all over the Old Testament. And it's really not meant to designate precision numerically. Rather, it is meant to designate bounty generally. In other words, you're really not supposed to make a distinction between 1,000 and 10,000. You're simply supposed to say, when you hear these two numbers put together, wow, that's a lot. And so when the women come and they sing this song, they say, Saul has slain his thousands, David, his tens of thousands. They're really not meaning to compare Saul to David. They're simply meaning to say, both our king and this warrior boy have done us a lot of good. They've helped us. They've slain a lot of our enemies, and we are thankful for them. They're meaning to celebrate both Saul and David. But you see, Saul is so insecure he doesn't recognize the figure of speech. He takes it as an insult. Actually, more than that, Saul takes this song as a threat. He thinks to himself in verse 8, they've credited David with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands. What more can David get but my king? Saul is worried that David represents a threat to his throne. Saul is worried that David may just stage a coup against him. And so Saul hatches a plan to take out this royal contender. Saul decides that he's going to kill Jonathan's best friend. He's going to kill David. 1 Samuel 19, verse 1. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David. And he warned David, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and I'll stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you. And I'll tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He's not wronged you. No, what he's done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all of Israel, and you saw it, and you were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Jonathan and David are so close that Jonathan is willing to go to his daddy, the king of Israel, and stand up for his friend. 
He is willing to argue for his friend's life. And it's kind of interesting how Jonathan argues for his friend's life because he argues using something known as the law of retaliation. And the law of retaliation is one of those ancient laws. It's found all over ancient literature. And the law of retaliation basically says if somebody hurts you, you can hurt them back. Kind of the classic expression of the law of retaliation, Leviticus 24, verses 19 and 20. If anybody injures his neighbor, whatever he's done must be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has injured the other, so he is to be injured. Now, you've got to understand something about the law of retaliation. The law of retaliation is really not there to promote violence. Rather, it is there to contain violence. Because the fundamental feature of the law of retaliation is this. The punishment must fit the crime. Somebody takes your eye, the only thing you can take from them is an eye. Somebody takes your tooth, the only thing you can take from them is a tooth. Somebody steals a hundred bucks from you, the only thing you can get back from them is a hundred bucks. You can't sue them for a million bucks because of pain and suffering and emotional anguish and all of that stuff. You see, the law of retaliation knows that violence and vengeance can spin out of control really, really quickly. And so the law of retaliation puts a cap on that. And it says the punishment actually has to fit the crime. Now what Jonathan does when he goes to his father Saul is he uses the law of retaliation, but he takes it and he turns it on its head. He says to his dad, Dad, David hasn't wronged you. What he's done has actually benefited you greatly. Why would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Here's what Jonathan is basically saying. He's saying to his dad, Dad, the law of retaliation says the only way you can hurt somebody else is if they hurt you first. But David hasn't hurt you, so you can't hurt him. And notice what what Jonathan's doing here. He's turning the law of retaliation into a catch-22. The law of retaliation says you can only hurt someone if they hurt you first, and someone can only hurt you if you hurt them first, which means that nobody can hurt anybody because nobody can make the first move. And now, all of a sudden, the law of retaliation has gone from from curbing violence, from containing it, to actually preventing it. Jonathan is going to his dad, and he's saying, Dad, you can't kill David. The only way that you can kill David, according to the law of retaliation, is if David kills you first. That's the argument that's being made here. But you see, this is the kind of friendship that David and Jonathan have. This is the kind of love and concern and care and compassion that the two of them share. They're great friends. And I'll tell you what, everybody needs a friend. You know, I've been thinking about this story a lot over this past week, and I've begun to realize that there are really some very valuable lessons that we can take away from this story. Some valuable lessons about what it takes to be a great friend, just like David and Jonathan were great friends. And so in the few minutes that we have remaining in this message, I just want to share with you three of those lessons. Three things that it takes to have a great friend and to be a great friend. Lesson number one is this, great friendship takes commitments. Great friendship takes commitments. Jonathan and David, they were committed to each other. That's why they made a covenant with each other. They were willing to be friends even unto the point of death. Let me ask you, how committed Are you to your friends? Are you with them through good times and in bad and happy and in sad? Through all of the trials and tribulations, ups and downs of this life, great friendship takes commitment. 
You know, I discovered that there is actually a world of difference between being friendly and being a friend. Because being friendly doesn't take a lot of commitment. It just takes being polite. You say hello, you ask someone how they're doing, you wait for the standard stock answer, oh, I'm doing fine, and you go your merry way. You don't really worry about someone too much when you're just friendly, but you do have great concern for them when they're your friend. Because when you're their friend, you're there for them even when nobody else is. When you're their friend, you're committed to them. Because great friendship takes commitment. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is this. Great friendship takes truth. Great friendship takes truth. One of the things that I respect so much about Jonathan is that in this story, we find out that Jonathan is not only a great friend to David, Jonathan is actually a great friend to his dad. Because Jonathan is willing to go into his dad's palace and tell him the truth, even when his dad doesn't want to hear the truth. He's willing to say to his dad, Dad, what you're doing by plotting and ploying to kill David is wrong. It's evil. It's wicked. It's depraved. You know what? Saul didn't want to hear that, but Jonathan was willing to say that. Jonathan was willing to tell his dad the truth, even when the truth hurt. You know, if commitment makes friendship stick, truth makes friendships deep. And so let me ask you something. Are you telling your friends the truth? Are you telling your friends the truth even when they don't want to hear the truth? Maybe they fall into a sin and you need to admonish them with the word of God. Maybe you need to tell your friends the truth about yourself, sins that you struggle with, addictions that you have, habits that you can't break. Friendship requires truth. If you don't know the truth about someone, your friendship is just up here rather than way down here, rather than in your gut, rather than in your soul. Great, deep friendship. It requires getting to know the real you and not just the you that you would pretend to be. Great friendship requires truth. That's lesson number two. Lesson number three, then, is this. Great friendship requires sacrifice. Great friendship requires sacrifice. You know, the reason that Saul hates David so much is because Saul perceives David as a threat. He thinks that David is going to steal his throne right out from under him. And so he makes a plan and a plot to kill David, to take out his royal contender. You see, Saul has a lot to lose. But I'll tell you what, in this story, Saul isn't the only one who has a lot to lose. Because the way that things work in monarchies is that the next king after the original king dies is usually the oldest son of that first king, which in this story just happens to be, anybody know? Jonathan. Jonathan is not just a boy. He's a prince. He's on tap to become the next king of Israel. And so if anybody should be upset with David, it should be Jonathan. If anybody should feel threatened by David, it should be Jonathan. If anybody should want to take out David, it should be Jonathan. But Jonathan doesn't do that. Instead, Jonathan pledges his loyalty, his honor, his honesty to David. Because Jonathan is a friend of David. You see, Jonathan is willing to sacrifice everything. He's willing to sacrifice the throne. He's willing to sacrifice his very royal future for David because Jonathan 
is David's friend. Friendship, sometimes it requires deep sacrifice. That's lesson number three. You know, as I've been thinking about friendship, I've come to realize that friendship, good, deep, real friendship, is not easy. You don't just fall into friendship. Friendship takes hard work. And that's why I've come to appreciate these precious words from Jesus all the more in John 15, verse 15, when Jesus says, I have called you friends. You see, my brothers and sisters, for Jesus to be able to say that, it wasn't easy. For Jesus to be able to say that, it took some work. What did it take from Jesus? It took commitment. It took a covenant. A covenant where Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always be there for you. It took the truth. Jesus, as our friend, promises to tell us the truth even when we don't want to hear the truth. That's why his favorite saying in the Gospels is always, I tell you the truth. He tells us the truth about ourselves, about our sinfulness, but he also tells us the truth about our God and his grace and his mercy. To be our friend, Jesus had to sacrifice. He had to sacrifice his very royal future when he came from his throne in heaven to a cross on earth. You see, for Jesus to call us his friends, it was not easy. It took a ton of work, but aren't you glad Jesus did that work for you? Aren't you glad he calls you friend? You know, I don't know where you are this morning. Some of you may be here, and you may have a ton of friendships. Yeah, everything may be going along great. And you feel great about your friends. All of your friendships are healthy. They're all moving along smoothly. Then again, maybe you're here this morning and you got at least one friendship. You know that one. That one that used to be really close, but now it's fallen apart. That one where the two of you used to do everything together, but now you're in a conflict with each other. And you know you have some work to do with that person. You know you have some work to do with that friend. Then again, you may be here this morning, and truth be told, if you were just really honest, you got a twinge of loneliness right here. You need friends, but they seem so few and far between. No matter who you are and no matter where you are this morning, This I want you to know, believe, and remember. Even when the friendships of this world fail and falter and fade, there is one who calls you friend. And he calls you friend in such a way that is so deep and so profound that his friendship with you lasts for all eternity because he himself is the eternal one. He himself is Jesus. And so, no matter what other friends you may have in your life, I hope that you have just one best friend. And I hope that his name is Jesus. Because there's just no other friend like him. He's my friend, and I'm so glad he is. I hope he's your friend, too. Because everybody, everybody needs a friend. Let's stand for closing prayer.
Heavenly Father, we know that you have called us to live in relationship with each other, and we thank you for the friends in our lives. Heavenly Father, above and beyond all the friendships that we have, may we always remember that Jesus is our best friend. He is the friend who died for us. He is the friend who redeems us. He is the friend who loves us unto eternity. And so, Heavenly Father, may we reflect the friendship that he has with us with the friends in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our friend. Amen. Now. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. And now, as you go from this place, remember that you go with your friend Jesus who never leaves you or forsakes you. And he has called you to shine like stars in the universe as you hold out God's precious word of life. Amen.